It was early in the morning in Salt Lake City, and Joe Hill was talkative. His voice was clear but low. He asked about his friends. Were any of them there? The blindfold forced him to ask. Two guards strapped him to the death chair. Hill straightened himself. I'll die like a man, he said. I never did anything wrong in my life. I died fighting, not like a coward. Well, goodbye, everyone. The gunman took aim at Joseph Hillstrom's heart as he spoke one last time. Fire, he roared. Let her go. The firing squad complied. At 7.41 a.m., Joe Hill died instantly. Happy Labor Day, everyone. I'm Matthew Billy, and this is Between the Liner Notes, a podcast about music, why it is the way it is, and how it got to be that way. Between the Liner Notes is distributed by the Goat Rodeo Network. We have a special episode for you this Labor Day weekend, including a way for you to participate in the story. We'll be sharing more details towards the end of the show, so stay tuned. The life of Joseph Hillstrom, better known to most as simply Joe Hill, may have ended in Salt Lake City, but his life began on the other side of the Atlantic in Sweden. He was born Joel Emanuel Heglund in a city located 100 miles north of Stockholm, named Jävle. He was born in 1879. His father was a railroad conductor and a good, talented, self-taught musician. And together they used to sing a lot at home, and and Joe was one of six siblings, and together the family often sang and played different instruments. That's William Adler, author of the Joe Hill biography titled The Man Who Never Died. Joe Hill enjoyed singing songs with his family, so much so that he began to write his own. When he was a, a little kid, he used to make up songs about, uh, about his siblings and tease them. Instead of writing his own music, he would often use well-known melodies, basically from the hymn book in church, but he would write his own funny words to it. And so it, it just seemed like it came naturally to him. Joe learned the joys of music from his father, Olaf, but he also learned the risks of working in a dangerous industrial job with no health or financial safety net. They had been living a pretty good, what would be considered a middle-class life. They owned a house. The father had a salaried position um, on the railroad, and they were doing pretty well. But then his father died in an industrial accident when Hill was eight years old, and that really sent the family into dire poverty. All of a sudden, his mother was the sole breadwinner, and she had six kids all under the age of 12, and no real means to support them. I should say also there was no real safety net like there is in Sweden and Scandinavian countries today. They're so famous for it, but back then there wasn't. And so you would go to private charities like the Salvation Army and basically beg for alms. Uh, Well, she was denied any assistance from the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army didn't record why they refused to help Margareta Katarina. But without the support of any charities, Joe Hill's mother had to take a job working long hours ironing. The stress of her grinding workload and responsibilities as a single parent of six took its toll on Margareta Katarina, and she developed a medical condition that went untreated and ultimately led to her death. His mother died at the beginning of 1902, and so at that point, her six um, children decided they would sell the house, the family house, and divide the proceeds. Joe and one of his older brothers decided they would use their share of the proceeds to buy passage on a ship to come to the U.S. and try to start anew. He arrived in New York City in October of 1902 without really any sort of a plan other than here he was in the new world. And uh, he started out working on the very lowest rung of the economic ladder. He cleaned spittoons down on the Bowery in lower New York for a while. Eventually um, decided to jump into the migrant stream and head out west. Like many immigrants before him, Hill journeyed west in search of a better life. What he found was not the west we know from Hollywood movies filled with prairie homesteads, lowly gold prospectors, and sharpshooting cowboys. Instead, he found an industrialized West that was the offspring of the Transcontinental Railroad, 
a land that held only the promise of dangerous jobs and unsanitary worker camps. In these camps, these, these workers were basically sleeping like stacked like cordwood, you know, hundreds of them in these barracks without running water, without adequate hygiene of any sort, without bathrooms, anything like that. But they were being charged excessive amounts for room and board and for hospitalization fees, so much so that often by the end of a pay period, the companies were claiming that these workers owed them more money than the company owed in in payroll. The jobs these men were given were backbreaking and dangerous. They worked as hard rock miners, muckers, timber beasts, lint heads, shovel stiffs, fruit tramps, dock wallopers, and stump ranchers. Work days could be 12 hours and work weeks could be seven days long. If a worker injured themselves on the job, there were plenty more waiting to replace them, and the disabled worker was left to fend for themselves without any health care or financial safety net. As the years ticked by, Joe Hill grew to believe that the employers were exploiting their workers. Then, in 1907, when Joe was introduced to a labor union fighting for the rights of these workers, he signed up. That union was called the Industrial Workers of the World, who are often referred to by their nickname, the Wobblies. The IWW was founded in Chicago in 1905. And one of its principal organizers was Big Bill Haywood, William D. Haywood, who had been a miner from Utah. And he and the others were calling for what he called a Continental Congress of the Working Class. He said that he wanted this new union, the Industrial Workers of the World, to reach down into the gutter and pull up this great mass of workers and give them a decent standard of living. Also, the IWW did not believe it was possible to reform capitalism. It believed you just couldn't tinker with that machinery. It believed in bottom-up organizing and uh, in direct action in the workplace. So instead of contracts, negotiating contracts, which they didn't believe in, they would use direct action techniques like slowdowns, like sit-downs, picketing on the job, and right in the workplace. The industrial workers of the world advocated for nonviolent direct action. And, unlike many other unions, the IWW did not discriminate based on race, gender, or religion. Anyone could be part of the one big union. The one big union meant that, unlike the AFL, which organized by industry, so they would have separate unions for, let's say, um, in the railroad industry, they would have a separate union for the boiler makers, for the conductors, for the engineers, and so on. But the IWW believed in organizing across unions, so they would have one union for railroads, and everybody who worked on the railroad and in every railroad line could belong to the IWW. And that way they felt like they had a lot more strength. There was a lot more solidarity because in the AFL, it's possible that the boilermakers, let's say, could go out on strike, but the engineers or the conductors would not. And so the boilermakers wouldn't have that much leverage. But if you could pull everybody off the railroad, all the workers, because they all belong to the same union, you'd have a lot more leverage. Joe Hill became a card-carrying member of the Industrial Workers of the World, and in 1908, he traveled to Spokane, Washington, to help out with the strike. This was really where the IWW started to come into full flower in Spokane, and this is about 1908, 1909. The IWW had gone there to try to organize a change to this standard practice that employment agents used in Spokane. These were private employment agencies, and they were basically in business to fleece workers. The way it worked was you would go into one of these 30-odd employment agencies. They were all in storefronts in Skid Row in Spokane, and uh, you'd pay your two or three bucks finder's fee for a job. And these employment agents, or labor sharks, as the IWW came to call them, would assign you to a job somewhere in the hinterland outside of Spokane. Because Spokane itself was a, a commercial center, but it wasn't an industrial center. But when you got there, inevitably, what you'd find was that there had been 20 or sometimes 30 other men 
who were hired for the very same job, or the job only lasted a week or two weeks. Employers churned through workers as fast as possible, firing them and hiring new ones every few weeks. The employment agencies were kicking back one-third of the finder's fee to the employers. So the more times a worker had to pay to get a job, the more money the labor sharks and the employers pocketed. If there were no jobs to send workers to, the agencies sent them to fake ones. And if a worker tried to challenge the agency's dubious practices in the courts, the judges always sided with the labor sharks. No one in Spokane was willing to stick up for the workers, except for the industrial workers of the world. The way to organize anything back then was to take over a street corner and stand on a soapbox and begin to preach the gospel of whatever you were preaching, whether it's um, you know labor solidarity or you're advocating for a single tax or you know you were the Salvation Army and you were saving souls. That's what you did. You bellowed. In the IWW, they called them jawsmiths, people who stood up on the soapbox or soapboxers and preached the, the gospel of labor solidarity. The IWW began to organize what they called the Don't Buy Jobs campaign and a boycott of the employment agencies. It began to have an effect on the labor sharks to the point where the labor sharks actually came up with a pretty ingenious solution. They hired the Salvation Army Band to start playing, blaring their drums and their horns and everything else every time a speaker from the IWW got up to harangue the labor sharks. And so it worked to drown out the speakers because even these leather-lunged orators could not compete you know, with those instruments. So it was a great source of irritation to the IWW, but also it was a source of inspiration. Joe Hill, who was hanging out in the Union Hall there and a bunch of other guys there, decided to do what Joe Hill had done when he was a young boy in Sweden, which was to take established melodies from the Salvation Army hymn book and write revolutionary lyrics to those songs. Now armed with their own customized lyrics, whenever the Salvation Army band began to play, the IWW would join them. They began by printing up the lyrics on little song cards and handing them out to the workers on the street corner. And everybody began to sing in unison. And it was this great means not only of social protest, as I said earlier, but as a tool for organizing, for bringing people together. Because even if you couldn't, you know, understand necessarily some sort of, you know, speech about economics, a song was different, as Joe Hill pointed out. People could really come together. The conflict with the Salvation Army Band was personal for Joe Hill. He never forgave them for turning his mother away, so he wrote a song using the melody of The Sweet By and By. Joe titled it, The Preacher and the Slave. You leave by and by in that glorious land above the sky, way up high, work and pray, live on hate. It really took direct aim at the Salvation Army. It was a song that pointed out the hypocrisy of the Salvation Army and, and how uh, it preached that uh, workers should be meek and humble and they would get their ultimate reward, their pie in the sky. And he really coined that term, by the way. And Hill said, you know, that's, that's not the way to live. And that really only plays into the hands of, of the ruling class. And so he wrote this song that really uh, poked fun in a particularly barbed way at the Salvation Army. This recording of The Preacher and the Slave is by Peter K. Siegel and Eli Smith off their album The Union Makes Us Strong. The new IWW songs had sabotaged the Salvation Army's attempts at disrupting the wobbly speeches, and the labor sharks were forced to find a new way to combat the IWW. This time, they lobbied the city's lawmakers to pass a law banning street speaking in Spokane. The city obliged, but the new law didn't stop the Wobblies from mounting their soapboxes. And you'll eat in the sweet by and by, you wise guy. The IWW began to respond by purposely having members throw themselves into jail. It was a pretty ingenious and dangerous, even reckless technique. 
So after they banned the IWW from the street corner, they knew that everybody who got up on a soapbox was going to get hauled away to jail. And so what they decided to do was, as they said, gum up the works. Industrial workers land behind bars, March 8, 1909. Because they did not take the police seriously when it issued orders prohibiting street oratory, 19 members of the industrial workers of the world awoke today in the cells of the city jail. The industrial workers were surrounded by 3,000 listeners on Main Avenue late yesterday afternoon when 10 policemen broke through the crowd and seized the orators. The prisoners offered no resistance and were taken off to jail in the most peaceable manner. The Tacoma Times. They put out the word, put out the call for IWW members from all over the West to come to Spokane to be arrested, to be thrown into jail, and to crowd those jails and to gum up the legal system. November 9, 1909. The response of the industrial workers of the world to this attack has been instant and unanimous. The speakers and workers are coming by hundreds, on the rods as well as the cushions, from all parts of the Northwest, ready for the jail. 150 men and women are now in jail. Some of them have been in the sweat box for 24 hours. A small cement cell, six by eight in the city jail, where 27 men were packed like sardines for this length of time, with no ventilation save the half of grated door, without sanitary conveniences of any kind. And yet, not the first effort of resistance to arrest has been made by any of the 150 men and women. The Spokane Press. The authorities had no choice but to release these IWW members because they just they didn't have the capacity to process them, basically. After months of Spokane's jails being filled, its court system clogged and more wobblies arriving each day, the city relented and finally allowed the soapboxers back on the street corners. The city also revoked the licenses of 22 of the most exploitive employment agencies. The headline in the next issue of the IWW's newspaper read, Strike Over victory achieved. The Wobblies had won. There is power, there is power in a band of working men when they stand hand in hand. That's a power, that's a power that must rule in every land. One industrial union brand. After the victory in Spokane, Hill continued to contribute songs to the IWW's organizing efforts, becoming one of the union's most prolific songwriters. The peak of his songwriting powers and the most time he was ever able to devote to songwriting occurred when he lived on the Los Angeles Harbor in the San Pedro district of L.A. The reason he was so prolific then, and he did write a good many of his songs for the IWW there, was because he had access to a piano for really the first and only time while he was in the country on a regular basis. One industrial union brand. Hill penned one of his most widely known songs on that piano. It was a song titled Mr. Block. A fellow Wobbly explained who Mr. Block was in this way. He is representative of that host of slaves who think in terms of their masters. Mr. Block owns nothing, and he speaks from the standpoint of the millionaire. He is patriotic without patrimony. He is a law-abiding outlaw who licks the hand that smites him and kisses the boot that kicks him. Mr. Block is the personification of all that a worker should not be. Walker C. Smith, 1913. Oh, Mr. Block, you were born by mistake. You take the cake, you make me ache. Tie a rock on your block and then jump in the lake. Kindly do that for liberty's sake. Along with Mr. Block, Hill's songs were regularly printed in an IWW publication that aimed to spread wobbly songs all over the world. In the years following the victory in Spokane, the publication called the Little Red Songbook had become an international phenomenon. After they found that they had pretty good success with these little song cards they were printing, they decided there in Spokane to print up the lyrics and as they began to write more songs into what they called the Little Red Songbook, which was a pocket-sized booklet with the lyrics to all their current songs and 
they would sell it for a dime, they passed it out, and it began to circulate all over the world because they would get it into the hands of merchant marines who would take it on their ships overseas at uh, these remote logging camps and mining camps and uh, everywhere else where the IWW had a presence, they began to sing these songs. You make me ache, tie a rock on your block and then jump in the lake. Kindly do that for liberty's sake. The Wobblies' winning record catapulted their membership numbers to new highs, but it also fueled the establishment's hatred for them. When the IWW would start to organize a city, the reaction could get violent. November 1910. It is incumbent upon all classes of citizens to aid the police in the suppression of these industrial workers of the world if they attempt to disturb the peace of the city. For men to come here with the express purpose of creating trouble, a whipping post and cat o' nine tails, well seasoned by being soaked in salt water, is none too harsh a treatment for peace breakers. Indeed, such a punishment would prove more efficacious than a term in a dark cell. The Fresno Herald and Democrat. Hill enjoyed his rising prominence as an IWW songwriter and also grew accustomed to the escalating hostilities towards the Wobblies. But nothing could prepare him for the fame he would find in Salt Lake City, where he traveled after leaving San Pedro and his beloved piano behind. And Joe Hill had run into a couple of fellow Swedes, two brothers, who had come to L.A. from Salt Lake City and decided, well, they would go back home because there was no longer any work for them on the docks. And they told Joe Hill and another friend of theirs, another fellow Swede named Otto Appelquist, that there were jobs in the mines and smelters around Salt Lake City and that they could come and that they could board with these two brothers, the Aselius brothers. And so in the late summer of 1913, Joe Hill found his way to Utah and to the Aselius brothers' house. By 1914, Utah had become hostile territory for the IWW. Once again, the Union had organized a successful strike. This one had targeted one of the state's largest railroad companies, and the powerful members of Utah's establishment were still steaming mad about the defeat. But despite the bitterness towards the Wobblies, Joe Hill's life in Salt Lake City was about as normal as it has ever been. He had friends, he had steady work and a decent place to live. But then, at the start of 1914, Hill's normal life turned completely inside out. On the 10th of January, 1914, it was a cold, clear Saturday night in Salt Lake City. There was a corner grocery store owned by a gentleman named John G. Morrison. And Morrison was uh, was a former cop in Salt Lake City. He was uh, 46 years old. And uh, it was this Saturday night. He was closing up for the week because they weren't open on Sundays. And he had two of his sons in the store with him, a 17-year-old and a 13-year-old. At about 9.45 in the evening, two masked men burst into the store through these double doors. They brandished their revolvers at John Morrison. And they said in unison, we've got you now, and started firing. And John Morrison went down soon to die. And the 17-year-old boy turned around, grabbed a revolver off a shelf, and either did or did not fire a shot at one of the masked men. And as the official record has it, hit him in the chest. So at that point, one of those masked men shot the 17-year-old boy dead as well. So there were two murders in the store that night. That same night, January 10th, at about 11 o'clock at night, Joe Hill shows up at a doctor's office about five miles from that store, and he presents with a gunshot wound. He goes in and, and the doctor says, what happened? And for the first and only time, he told somebody how he received that wound. And what he said was, he was shot in a row over a woman But he never named the shooter, and he didn't name the woman, and never again did he speak, at least publicly, about the circumstances of his gunshot wound. The next day, the double murder was front-page news in all the Salt Lake City newspapers, and all eyes were on the effort to track down the killers. A day later, the governor of Utah posted a $500 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the perpetrator. That was a lot of money 
you know, in 1914. When the doctor who had treated Joe Hill read that story, he called the police and he said, I think I may have your man and said that he came in on Saturday night with a gunshot wound. And not only that, but he's a member of the industrial workers of the world. The night after the doctor reported Hill to the authorities, he visited his patient again to give him a dose of morphine, telling Hill it was for the pain. Some time after midnight, a knock at the door woke Joe from his morphine-induced sleep. Three policemen stuck their guns in his face. One officer later reported that he thought he'd seen Hill make a move for a gun, so he fired, piercing Hill's hand. The police arrested him and searched his house for the murder weapon. They didn't find a murder weapon or even a gun the cop thought Hill was reaching for. But they did find the lyrics to two love songs Hill had been writing and a red IWW card in his pocket. The next day, Salt Lake's newspapers reported that one of the suspects in the grocery store double murder had been caught. There were four newspapers in Salt Lake City, four dailies at the time, and they often didn't agree on things. Some were Democrats, some were Republican papers, but they all agreed that the IWW was a dangerous entity and that it had to go. I mean, it was a textbook case of prejudicial pretrial publicity because they labeled him a thug, you know, this radical, dangerous radical member of this militant union. The newspaper's incessant coverage of Hill's case made finding impartial jurors nearly impossible, and the jury selection process was taking an unprecedented amount of time. Finally, the judge became impatient. And so the judge finally got fed up. And he said, you know what, I'm just going to appoint the rest of the jurors myself. And so he did. He selected three jurors who had previously served on a trial. They had just dismissed those jurors from the previous trial. With the jury selected, the judge opened the trial. As the prosecution began its case, it was very clear that despite all the newspaper stories about Hill's crime-ridden lifestyle, there was very little direct evidence pointing to his guilt. The state couldn't show that there was any blood on the floor of the Morrison's grocery store other than that which belonged to the Morrison father and son who were killed. This despite the fact that supposedly Joe Hill was shot there. But there was no bullet recovered. And whatever bullet hit Joe Hill went into his chest and then passed through his shoulder because when Joe Hill went to the doctor that night, the doctor recorded the exit wound. And so you would think that if Hill had been shot in there, they would have found the bullet, but no bullet was ever found. There was no other direct evidence. There was no murder weapon found. There was no positive ID of Hill. And there was no motive found. They never showed or even attempted to show a motive. They couldn't show a connection between Mr. Morrison and Joe Hill. Although they said that whoever killed John Morrison would have done so for revenge because it wasn't a robbery attempt. As I said, these masked men rushed into the store. They shouted, we've got you now and fired. They never made an attempt at the till. And once they shot him, they left. So that raises the question, why would Hill have shot Morrison if their paths had never crossed? John Morrison's surviving son, Merlin, testified that he saw Joe Hill shoot his father, but even his testimony was discredited. The only eyewitness who really wasn't an eyewitness because he was hiding in the rear storeroom was the 13-year-old boy, Merlin Morrison, who described what he heard, and his testimony changed quite a bit. But ultimately, he had to acknowledge that he didn't get a look at the perpetrators, and so all he could tell was what he had heard. The prosecutor's only connection between Joe Hill and the murder was that Hill had been shot on the same night and that he was a member of a dangerous labor union. The only circumstantial evidence, as I said, was the fact that he was a card-carrying member of the IWW. So beyond that, they really had no evidence. And the, um, the prosecutor kind of acknowledged that. In his closing arguments, he talked about the evil of the IWW. And he, he told the jurors that by convicting Hill, they would send a blaze of liberty against the dark sky of anarchy. They were trying him as a labor organizer. They were using that sort of as a backdrop of, you don't like this person, please convict him. That's Clayton Sims, a criminal defense attorney who practices in Utah. And you see that that's a technique that works, and it can often be used in modern trials as well. This person has gang ties. 
This person is part of an unpopular group, has a religion that is out of favor. The prosecutor can communicate to the jury, look, convict him. He's not a person that you can relate to. He's not a person, you know, he's a person that's likely to do this. Beyond using Hill's labor affiliation to persuade the jury, the judge also made some legal decisions that benefited the prosecution. He allowed the prosecution to ask leading questions during direct examination. When a witness said something that contradicted their testimony in the preliminary hearing, the judge refused to allow the preliminary hearing transcripts to be entered into evidence. But of all the forces working against Joe Hill, Joe Hill himself was the most damaging. At one point, he fired his lawyers in the middle of court in front of the jury. He then tried representing himself even though he didn't know the first thing about criminal law. On more than one occasion, he interrupted court proceedings, and he refused to provide any details about what he was doing on January 10th, 1914, the night of the murder. He said all along that it wasn't his responsibility to prove his innocence. The state had to prove his guilt, and they hadn't done it, and they couldn't do it, and therefore he was not going to testify. He was not going to provide an alibi. He was not going to do anything. He was just going to be silent. And so the prosecutor, and for that matter, the judge basically said, well, that's certainly suggestive of somebody with something to hide. He must be guilty. One of the difficulties, I think, with Joe Hill's trial is that he truly believed that someone is innocent until proven guilty. And his tactical mistake was that he relied on that. Rather than present a defense, he relied on the fact that, hey, I'm innocent until proven guilty. That's my birthright that's in the Constitution, that's our legal system, rather than actively participating in his defense, that he thought that that was enough, which was a tactical mistake. On June 26, 1914, after closing arguments had been made, the judge gave his instructions to the jurors before they started deliberation. He told them that it was okay to convict someone in Utah on circumstantial evidence. The jury made up its mind before the end of the day. He was convicted of first-degree murder, then sentenced to death by the judge. Before that, the IWW had really not gotten involved in the case because, again, I think nobody really believed on Hill's side that the case was going to amount to anything. And so, you know, they left it alone. Also, I think they didn't want to drag the IWW into it because they were considered to be a dirty word in Utah. But once he was sentenced to death, that's when the IWW began really a global campaign to try to spare Hill's life. The IWW organized rallies in major American cities, in pretty much every city you could think of. There was a rally to support Joe Hill, and not just in the cities, but in these remote mines and, and mills and, and logging camps, and not just in the U.S., but in the United Kingdom, in Australia, and elsewhere. In fact, in Australia, dock workers said they were going to refuse to unload ships from the United States until and unless Hill was granted a new trial. And so this campaign by the IWW generated something on the order of 40,000 letters and telegrams and petitions to the governor. Even President Woodrow Wilson sent the governor of Utah a letter, but the governor and the Utah Board of Pardons held firm. If Joe Hill wasn't willing to provide any new information about his whereabouts on the night of the murder, the state wasn't willing to change its mind either. All of his friends and supporters, Big Bill Haywood, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, his appellate lawyer, they were pleading with him to testify, and he wouldn't do it. He said it wasn't his job to prove his innocence. After a long battle, Hill's allies finally ran out of ways to stall the execution, and on November 19, 1915, Joe Hill was blindfolded and seated in a chair in front of a firing squad. Right up to the very last moment, Joe professed his innocence. Then the firing squad fired its volley. He died instantly. I dreamed I saw Joe here last night Alive as you and me Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead I never died, says he I never died, says he the body was claimed by Joe's friends in the IWW, who placed it aboard a train bound for Chicago. The funeral was held in Chicago, and on Thanksgiving Day of 1915, some 30,000 people turned out for his funeral. It was one of the largest funerals in the history 
of the city. Not that many could crowd into the West Side Auditorium where it was held, but there were thousands upon thousands of people on the streets lining the West Side Auditorium for blocks. And, you know, they sang his songs at the funeral and people on the outside of the building were echoing those on the inside. And so this whole street was singing in unison Hill songs. After Hill's execution, his legacy became mythology. Union halls all over the world have the words from his last letter to Big Bill Hayward, whom Hill instructed not to mourn, but to organize. Songs were written about him, including I Dreamed I Saw Joe Hill Last Night, which Joan Baez famously sang at Woodstock. A hundred years later, historians are still fascinated by him and by the question of what was he actually doing on the night of the murder. Historians like Bill Adler. I kept seeing letters from a particular researcher from the 1940s, a man named Aubrey Hahn. He apparently was writing a novel about Joe Hill, but he had done such in-depth research that I was fascinated. I wanted to read the book. Well, I couldn't find the book. It apparently was never published. And so I started looking for any survivors, and I found his daughter. And I said, do you know anything about your dad's research into Joe Hill? And she said, no, but there's a bunch of boxes up in my attic, and let me go take a look and see what I can find. And, you know, she eventually called back and said, yes, I have seen letters from this woman named Hilda Erickson. Bill Adler recognized the name Hilda Erickson immediately. When Joe Hill moved to Salt Lake City, he did so at the invitation of the Aselius brothers, whom he'd met in California. Hilda Erickson was their niece and knew both Joe Hill and another friend the brothers invited, Otto Applequist. Here is what Adler found in the letter. Hilda Erickson was about a a 20-year-old woman in Salt Lake City who was the niece of these boys Joe Hill was staying with in Salt Lake when he first went there. Joe Hill was, was actually rooming with another fellow Swede, a guy named Otto Applequist. And Joe and Otto had a a rivalry over Hilda, the fair-haired, blue-eyed Hilda. And Otto had been engaged to marry Hilda. And then they broke it off. And Joe was, uh, you know, he was taunting and teasing Otto about it as he would. He was a pretty sarcastic fellow in many ways. And Otto took offense at that. And so that led to a showdown one night in which Otto shot Joe, according to this letter that Hilda wrote 35 years later. Applequist took Hill to the doctor after shooting him. Then he packed his things and left Salt Lake City forever. So, if Applequist is long gone and the information in Hilda's letter is true, why would Hill sacrifice his life to keep the story secret? This is speculation on my part, but I think there were a few reasons. For one, he didn't want to implicate Hilda Erickson because, uh, you know, apparently they had carried on a relationship and he didn't want to besmirch her reputation. And remember, this is Victorian era and he was being gallant, so he didn't want to name her. But another thing is, with all that publicity he was getting in prison, I think he began to see himself as others saw him, which was as an icon a real global icon of the working class, this symbol of resistance. And I think that once he saw himself as that, he would have felt that he was letting people down if he didn't carry through and become a martyr. Decades after Joe Hill's death, the battle to clear his name continued. In 1979, on Hill's 100th birthday, the AFL-CIO filed a petition to exonerate him. The state of Utah refused. Then, in 2015, after reading about the discovery of Hilda Erickson's lost letter, Clayton Sims, the Utah-based criminal attorney you heard from earlier, attempted to exonerate Hill once again and filed the paperwork with the state. The response was less than enthusiastic. Essentially, the governor had a, you know, a one-page, you know, thanks for your petition, but go talk to the Board of Pardons, talk to the Attorney General's office. And the Attorney General essentially, I don't even know if they responded, but the Board of Pardons simply just denied it and said, we don't deal with pardons for people who are dead. And so they didn't examine it on the merits. You know, we didn't get a letter from the governor saying, no, Joe Hill was convicted and executed lawfully and he committed the crime. Thank you very much. We deny your petition based upon the merits. 
So neither the Board of Pardons, the Attorney General's Office, or the Governor has looked at the merits of the case. They've simply rejected it out of hand without a full analysis. But I think if there's more attention and more political pressure on it, I think that they have to really examine it. The state of Utah may have dismissed previous petitions for Joe Hill's exoneration, but Utah has never been challenged by engaged podcast fans with robust social media accounts. As we were working on this episode, everyone in Between the Liner Notes and the Goat Rodeo Network were also organizing a petition to exonerate Joe Hill. You can find the petition at change.org by searching for the term Joe Hill, or you can go to betweenthelinernotes.com. There will be a link to the petition at the top of the home page. If you believe Joe Hill's trial should have been overturned, or Hilda Erickson's letter is new evidence that proves Hill should not have been executed by a firing squad, please sign this petition, tell everyone you know about it, and share it on all your social media accounts. This Labor Day of 2016 could be the moment where we work together and build a movement strong enough to exonerate Joe Hill. Before Hill was executed, he wrote out his will, which included a final request to be carried out after his death. He wrote this on the last night of his life. He was sitting on the cot in his prison cell. He wrote this and then he gave it to a reporter who was doing a deathbed interview with him and asked him to take it out and publish it. My will is easy to decide, for there is nothing to divide. My kin don't need to fuss and moan. Moss does not cling to a rolling stone. My body, oh, if I could choose, I would to ashes it reduce, and let the merry breezes blow, my dust to where some flowers grow. Perhaps some fading flowers then would come to life and bloom again. This is my last and final will. Good luck to all of you. Joe Hill. A year to the day after his execution, the IWW was meeting for its general assembly in Chicago, and there, Big Bill Haywood passed out hundreds of packets of Joe Hill's ashes, gave them to the delegates from around the world, and asked them to spread Joe Hill's ashes. And Haywood later reported that the ashes were spread on four continents and in 47 of the 48 United States, all but Utah. Ramble around the country and away you will You always run across Sizzle Bill Found upon the desert and in the hills In the modern camps and the lumbar mills This episode was produced by me, Matthew Billy, and Ashley Lusk. Nathaniel Billy was assistant producer. The editors were Ashley Lusk and Tim Townsend. The archival news articles were read by Ashley Lusk and Adam Hainsfurther. Thanks to all my guests, including William Adler, you can find out more about his Joe Hill biography at themanwhoneverdied.com. And also Clayton Sims. You can find out more about his legal practice at claytonsims.com. Most of the original recordings of Joe Hill's songs were by Peter K. Siegel and Eli Smith off their album The Union Makes Us Strong. The other songs, I Dreamed I Saw Joe Hill Last Night and Mr. Block, were recorded by Joe Glazer for his album The Songs of Joe Hill. The instrumental tracks were composed and recorded by Josh Woodward. You can find out more about his work at joshwoodward.com. As a reminder, when you are finished listening, please visit change.org and sign the petition to exonerate Joe Hill. You can also find a link to the petition at our website, betweenthelinernotes.com. Tweet about it, share it, stand on a street corner and start soapboxing about it. Whatever it takes to get the word out. And, as always, thanks for listening. We'll have more great stories about music for you. And an update about the Joe Hill petition on the next Between the Liner Notes. Sizzle Bill gets his reward in heaven. Oh sure, he'll get it, but he'll get it in the neck. <laughs>